Good morning. Good to see you. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Andrea? All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, so glad you're all here. Who's all um, here? Good morning. Oh, just a second. My YouTube is playing in the background. Ah. Look at everybody. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Well, hi. Uh, so it looks like um, if you can't see everyone, you can switch your views of how you can see things. But you are joined this morning by uh, myself and Michelle, who are uh, hosting this space this morning for everyone. And then it uh, looks like we have Andrea with us, Pat Peterson. Uh, we have Barb Halverson, Barbara Heim. We have another Barbara. We have Charles. We have the Mahanes. We have Cheryl Southerd. Thankfully, we have uh, Daniel Harrell with us this morning because <laughs> I, I'm making Annie's organic uh, out of the can uh, cinnamon rolls this morning in my oven, so you, <laughs> you wouldn't want to see that. Um, and then uh, we have the Therese, the Therese group, maybe, I don't know, Debbie, I don't know if both of you were there, but Debbie's there. And uh, we have some Hansons. We have, let's see, who's, is Frank the, oh, there it is, there's, uh, there's some Canfields, uh, good morning, we have the Eatons, we have Judy Weshley with us, uh, Lori, uh, we have Rick and Paige with us, we have the Neil, Sally Mannard's on, who's Samsung, I'm not sure who Samsung is, um, we have, oh, I see a Dave Pinsky, I see a Therese, uh, some Mahanes, uh, well, and more folks will be joining us, we're going to be streaming right now, we're at live on YouTube, we're so glad you're here with us this morning. Um, as we begin, I'll just give you a little bit of context and overview for what we're doing this morning. Um, so what we're, what we're doing is our Ministry of the Month is Community Emergency Services. And uh, as Michelle and I were talking about that being our Ministry of the Month, um, we just started talking about, I think this is actually your, your idea, Michelle, right? Like to do something around faith or food and to say, you know what, it's still COVID. We're not able to get out of our homes in the same way uh, that we would if this, you know, COVID were over and um, really wanting to make a connection that as we're gathering together around our Ministry of the Month CES to really deepen our, our own inner lives around the connections between faith and food and the spirituality of it and also to be able to have some fun. And we thought who better to kick us off for our three, we're gonna do this for three Saturdays in a row uh, but who better to kick us off than the chef himself, Daniel Harrell, our former senior minister and a lover of things, all things faith and food, I do believe would be accurate to say of you. And so um, as we gather this morning, I'm just going to say a gathering prayer and then uh, we'll jump in. So welcome everyone. God, in this morning, we remember that you are the bread of life. And so as we gather at these tables and with our coffee and might we be reminded at all times that you are the one who feeds and nourishes our souls and our bodies and this earth. And might we live and order our lives and ourselves in such a way that there is food enough and goodness that can nourish in all ways for all people. Give you thanks for each person gathered this morning and for the beauty of creativity of what can happen in the magic of creation of food. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, just a little bit before we really jump in here, I think we'll do a little bit to talk about CES. CES is our, our ministry of the month and uh, really grateful and excited because um, Judy has joined us this morning to share a little bit about uh, CES and their work. Um, and so um, just a little bit about Judy as she's gonna share with us. She started share, uh, volunteering in the late 80s with, um, hadn't been at CES for a long time, but can speak to you know just that longevity of the program. And um, I hear that Judy, you might know something about canned pumpkin that you might wanna share with us. So Judy, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, and then um, we'll have uh, you share a little bit about CES. Um, I can remember we had we had a whole shelf full of canned pumpkin, 
in our limited little food shelf space that we had. And it was so funny because we never really gave it out because when you think about it, I don't know if you've ever made a pumpkin pie, it takes a lot of ingredients like a pie shell and it takes um, spices and it takes eggs and all these things. And most people who are coming to a food shelf either do not have the time or the energy or the wherewithal to buy all those other things. And so those little cans used to sit there for a long, long time. And I remember when I first started giving to food shelves before I got educated, I would go through my cupboard and I'd see all the things that were kind of, I'd had there a long time, like artichoke hearts that I didn't use. And, you know, I give those and, you know, now it's so helpful when the food shelves give out their list of things they can use because it's so much more relevant to what the clients need. So. Well, thanks for being here uh, this morning, Judy, and thanks for your connection and, and long work with CES. Uh, we, don't, we invite you, um, I'm gonna put in the chat here for anyone who wants to get involved this month with our mission of the month CES, you can uh, bring by food as drop off. You can bring a donation because you know, Judy, that's a big thing where they're able to get um, more product than we ever could buy. Um, uh, and know, they know what the needs of the clients are. It's another way that you can give. I put that, that link in the chat for everyone. Uh, so with uh, no further uh, ado, um, uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Daniel Harrell to uh, bring us into what, what are we making this morning, Daniel? Um, let me get you unmuted, Daniel, if you're not already. You got it, you're good. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm, now I hear Rick and Pedro, mm -hmm. which is intimidating to me because Rick is a real chef. I'm a home cook, I'm not a chef. But we Daniel, are before you, Daniel, before you start, <laughs> since many of us have had no connection with you since you left, could you just give us a real executive update on just a quick sort of overview of just what's what what you've been doing for the last six months is that jim yes it's jim eaton i'm sorry Hi, uh yeah well uh the last six months it's been a year <laughs> um, i know what you've been doing but i don't but know uh, yeah i um i am the editor-in-chief of uh, christian today magazine which is uh, located in the suburbs of chicago um and it's been a eventful year with all that has uh transpired, uh, certainly um, not only on the religious front, but no doubt with the pandemic and with just the craziness of our politics and um, with issues here in Minneapolis and worldwide, after the killing of George Floyd, all of those things we've uh, been working with um, at Christianity Today. I, uh, I do a, a lot of writing, a lot of editing. I manage a, a great editorial team. We <clears throat> put out a uh, print magazine um, nine times a year, um, but every day up on our website, new articles, um, and then podcasts and media. So it's a it's a it's a new area, but but um, enjoyable and work with some great people. The the plan had been, of course, for a violent night in Luke, Chicago, but um, we had postponed that for a year after uh, Dawn died. Just it just was too much and. Um, I think everybody online knows my wife died um, a couple of years ago almost, and it's hard to believe it's been two years almost, but we decided uh, to postpone that move and then the pandemic hit, so uh, now it looks like we're Minnesotans through high school at least. Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, haven't been many places. Um, we uh, have... <clears throat> We've, we have bubbled up with uh, another family. Um, some of you know the Meadows family. We've been kind of bubbling up with them to have things to do. And, but otherwise, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been sort of what you're experiencing. So I've been doing a lot of cooking um, to, to feed us. Unfortunately, my daughter doesn't really like my food. But, <laughs> you know, what do you do? She's a mac and cheese, uh, raw vegetables kind of girl. Healthy, but not super inspiring to cook for. So thanks for asking, Jim. That's yeah. really kind of you to ask. Thank you. So it's, it's early in the morning to be cooking what I'm uh, going to cook, but I've made it a couple of times and it's pretty tasty. This is a, a mushroom bourguignon, which is just, you know, the French for burgundy, but if you say bourguignon, it sounds much fancier. Um, <clears throat> it's a, um, you've probably had beef bourguignon or beef burgundy, uh, obviously made popular by Julia Child. 
this is a riff on that recipe by um, Melissa Clark, who is a, a New York Times cooking um, recipe writer, and I really like her stuff. And so I'm going to kind of riff on that a little bit. Those of you who cook know that cooking is more alchemy than baking, which is more chemistry. So, you know, you like to play and goof off. And so I think the recipe has been um, shared. And, you know, those, those of you who- in the uh, chat too, Daniel. Oh, good. Those of you who cook a lot, those of you who cook a lot know that when you're learning a recipe, you should follow it to the T. But, you know, as you've cooked it a few times, it's fun to, to dink around. Um, and so I'll be doing a little bit of that today, though. I'll also follow it. But it's super tasty. Um, you know, it's a great winter dish. And uh, I thought it'd be fun because it just followed the mushrooms it introduces you to. I don't know if you're mushroom fans. Um, if you're not, then you can just use beef. But uh, Violet's a vegetarian and does love mushrooms. And so I thought, well, let's do mushrooms. She won't eat this anyway, but still be fun to think about her while I'm cooking it. Um, so we're going we're gonna to start with just all the different kinds of mushrooms. And maybe we'll do a little test here. This is, somebody know who that, what this one is? So shiitake. Feel free to unmute yourself. If you, if you want to respond, you can even hit your space bar and just temporarily unmute yourself. Yeah, if you want to guess. That's a shiitake. This one, of course, you know. Portobello, that's right. This one, a crimini. Now, I don't expect you to know this one. This is a king, king trumpet. Oyster. A king trumpet. That's a king trumpet. How about this one? Lion's mane. Lion's mane, right. And then these? Hen of the woods? No, close. I don't know. Oyster? Oyster, yeah. And the great thing about mushrooms is like even when they get fungus on them, it's okay because they're fungus. So um, we're going to cut up some mushrooms here. And what this recipe just calls for is uh, just a, a bunch of different mushrooms that um, you uh, cook in butter and then um, eat and enjoy in a, a reduced down sauce. Now I want to give a shout out for the knife. The knife... Um, is, uh, was a gift from uh, uh, Todd Myers, who works with uh, Wustoff. And the number one most important thing to have in your kitchen is a sharp knife. I can't tell you all the people I admire who cook, and then I go to their kitchen and the knives aren't sharp. It just. <sighs> um, so if, you, uh, if you've never had your knife sharpened, then get them sharpened. And then all you need is your steel, right? You just need your steel to keep it sharp. Just um, give it a little whack whack every time you every time you use it, and it'll keep your knife super sharp. Um, the cool thing about all these different uh, mushrooms is, you know, you don't tend to think of uh, if you've, you've probably had, you know, obviously shiitake mushrooms in Asian cooking or portobellos in Italian cooking, um, but they they each do have kind of unique uh, flavors to them, and it's really fun to. Um, a violet loves her mushrooms raw, so she'll eat a bag full just without anything, which I don't quite understand, but that's kind of her, her MO. Um, hey, Daniel, we have a question in the comments from Charles. Uh, where did you buy your mushrooms? I get my mushrooms at the, the Linden Hills Co-op. Um, those of you that have ever gotten to deep food conversations with me, you know I'm all into sourcing um, and where food comes from and because my, you know, my food evangelist side argues that, you know, you put this stuff into your body, right? And since you're putting food into your body every day, you want to get what's uh, good and healthy and uh, safe um, and supports uh, local farming. But I would also argue that, um, you know, that food that has been uh, cared for and, and grown and good dirt, Bob Don was on, he'd be a big fan of good dirt. It, it tastes better. Um, those of you who may be familiar with uh, Dan Barber, who's a famous New York chef, he makes a big argument that the most important thing for flavor is um, dirt. And that the better your dirt, the better your um, what's grown in the dirt and the more flavorful it is. He has an entire appetizer at his um, Blue Hills restaurant in upstate New York. That's just a, it's just a, it's, they hang them, it's radishes. 
and they're just raw again. I would love that. Um, Daniel, are you removing the stems? I am removing the stems on the, the tough stems on the um, shiitakes for sure. Okay. And you don't have to remove the stems. I, I just do. Um, but no, you don't have to. The, um, but you don't want to clean them. You don't want to usually wash mushrooms in water because they get soggy. So I just, okay. um, I mean, you can if you use them right away, I guess. Um, but I usually just wipe them. Like again, a little dirt never hurt anybody, right? That's yeah. a good thing. Might as well eat a little bit. Um, but anyway, the uh, you know I'm I'm so into flavor that you know whatever I can do to enhance flavor, I'm all I'm always on a flavor search. And so these mushrooms do come from the um, Linden Hills Co-op, and uh, they've got an, an incredible uh, array of, of mushrooms. Um, and then when the farmers markets come out in the the summer, you'll see a lot of purveyors of, of mushrooms um, and things I've never heard of. One of you mentioned the, gosh, you the tree of blood. What was it? The tree of, when you were guessing the oyster? Ten of the woods. Yeah, yeah, that one. Is that Paige? Yeah, Paige and Rick, yeah. Yeah, that one. They sell that one at the co-op. Um, yeah, you can forage for it sometimes, too, if you get really lucky. Where would you find it? Um, we forage like in wooded areas. We go up towards the Coon Rapids Dam. We've had good luck there, but um, you can find morels more often than than hen of the woods okay. or chanterelles. Yeah, you should you should have had Rick cook one of these, um, um, Sarah, because he's the real deal, man. Anyway, I'm not intimidated at all. So, um, <laughs> so here we go. We're just going to cook these mushrooms down and. You know, typically in Italian cooking, they use olive oil, French cooking, a lot of butter, and, you know, one of the things that makes um, restaurant meals so good is just all the butter they use. And uh, good butter is good butter. I love the hope butter that um, they sell at the co-op. They sell that at Linden Hills, too. Um this spoon was a gift. Rick Hansen is kind of cool. He brought it back for me, I think, from his trip. So there's a stirring side and a tasting side. One of the things I'm sure you all do as you're cooking is you want to uh, taste your food as you cook it. <clears throat> and I like uh, the advice of, uh, of a southern cook, uh, Vivian Howard, who argues you should you should salt as you go rather than you know waiting for the end. So you know if you've read. Um, the popular book, um, salt, fat, acid, heat, if that's the right order. Um, salt is just essential to flavor. And so I've got like four different kinds of salts I use. This is just the diamond kosher salt I use in the initial cooking because it's got a lot of air in it and well, it's not as potent as iodized salt, which I don't tend to use at all. And um, it will uh, kind of meld into the food and bring out that flavor a little faster. Some of you that are uh, longtime colonial folks will remember a series of talks I gave on the uh, reduction for the sake of flavor. And there's something about when you reduce food down, a good sauce, the key is always in reducing and it just intensifies, intensifies flavor. So that's what we're doing. We're going to cook these mushrooms down. They're going to re release their juices and we'll see what happens. Now, this, this recipe calls for pearl onions, but it's uh, a couple more on the floor. It's um, it's hard to find um, organic pearl onions, or at least I haven't had a lot of success. So I'm using a uh, cipollini onions, which are so good. You know, they're kind of somewhere between a shallot and a red onion, and um, I really like them. I hadn't had them until I think until I cooked this dish, but I've started using them in place of so many other onions and um. You're going to leave these a little uh, larger. You're not going to cut them all the way down, but you just want to peel them up. And I usually what leave kind them. are those, Daniel? Cipollini. Cipollini. Thank you. C I O L A N I. Cipollini. Um, and I've only found these at the co-op too. I'm, I'm sure you can get them at other probably Whole Foods and specialty stores like that. Um, but if um, you know, again, if you're an avid home cook, you know, onion is the, the basis of 
really so much of a umami savory flavor in your food. And so being familiar with all the onions from, we'll use, um, we'll use leeks as well as, as this cipollini today. Um, we won't use any yellow onions though. And I try to get, you know, you try to get these hard peels off and, um, yeah, a lot of good flavor. And these will go in as the, the onions reduce down. I, I mean, mushrooms reduce down. Another aspect of a southern cooking, at least, and this is probably true across cooking, mushrooms are one of these things that you don't want to stir around too much. You want to let them caramelize on the bottom and get that nice brown. Um, I don't want to call it a crust, but part that uh, really brings out the flavor. So you just leave them alone for a couple of minutes and let them start to release their juices and um, get all that yumminess out. It's kind of hard to have a running narrative with chopping, but you know, I was going to do some of this ahead of time. Um, but it's kind of fun to do it while you're watching, as long as I don't cut myself, which I do do. So you'll see I'm kind of leaving these onions um, uh, in bigger shape, and now we'll put them in, and they'll they'll cook down with the, the sauce once we get the once we get the sauce going. City of Minneapolis has organic waste, and so you know, get all your stuff in the organic pile and cut it off. So you can see already how that big bowl of mushrooms is down to that. I'm cooking a half recipe here because, again, Violet won't eat it. So but you can see how fast that that cooks down. So I'm gonna throw the onions in, let them get down a little bit. And if you're doing a full recipe, you probably have to do a couple batches because you know if you crowd, if you crowd the food, it just steams. It doesn't really cook it. Mm. All right. Well, that's um, getting ready. Um, I'm just gonna cook up this leek and of course if you've ever cooked a leek you know they got a lot of dirt in them so you gotta usually cut them in half or I do and come over here and <clears throat> clean them out on the inside get all the dirt out Thomas Keller French Laundry always says you put your uh, towel in your belt here don't drape it over your shoulder but that would make you a diner cook I'm just chopping up um, this leek recipe calls for two. I'm just doing one. If you've ever had, I'm sure you've had leek, leek and potato. They're, they're such a great flavor. And um, you know, not as um, if you're not a big onion fan, these aren't as strong or milder. Three though. And then um, it calls for a carrot. A lot of you know French cooking. Um, calls for a, a base of onion, carrot, and uh, celery, which is what you may have heard of you know, mirepoix, but this one doesn't call for celery. I was going to throw some in, but I'm not sure that's going to be So I got my leeks down, and then of course the carrot. <clears throat> uh, your carrot's not going to cook if it's uh, if it's too thick, and since it takes a while to get a, it takes a while for me at least to get a carrot thin enough. I just will use a mandolin, just a little quicker. <clears throat> it just cuts it quicker. 
Careful. Taking off the end of my thumb a couple times. There is a safety guard for these. Actually, if you just get a little slower at the end, it'll. Vivian Howard cut her finger on her mandolin on one of her shows, Daniel. Did you see it? Who did that? Vivian Howard. She did? She did. She did. She warned everybody, don't cut yourself, and she proceeded to cut herself. She never uses that protective guard. Yes, she does not. She should. Who was that? Cynthia Latham. Oh, Cynthia, hi. Paid hi. Well. That's right. <laughs> That's how most people know me. <laughs> that's not a bad way to be known, Cynthia. So you can see that's that's just about that's pretty good. Um, you can smell it. It looks so good. What's it smell it like? It's so good. Yeah, I'm actually gonna add a little pepper. I, I like stuff a little. Like just because I'm getting older, I need pepper to help me taste it. But. All right. So now um, we're gonna we're gonna take this out um, for a second while we kind of build the sauce base. And um, I got into I got into cooking for the flavor, but another thing I love about it is the um, or the knives and the tools and. You don't have a good uh, Dutch oven like this one. Um, good investment. If you like to cook, ask for Christmas. This is the, you know, the Le Creuset and you know, expensive, but kind of gold standard, and I love it. Um, cook bread in it. Cook almost every soup and sauce. And, and so, more butter, of course. So we'll put some more butter in. Um, We'll uh, get the leeks and carrots started. I'm gonna add some garlic. Uh-oh. Again, I'm on salt as I go kind of guy. All right. Take it out of the pot because it'll get hot. I'm gonna burn myself walking in the mouth. So then, um, uh, I think I uh, calls for three cloves of garlic. I'm, um, I always go a little more on the garlic just because I like it. Of course, a little garlic trick if you give it a pound, the skins come off easier. Um, and then I don't know if this is standard form, but I always like to give the garlic a, a smash because it's a living thing, and if you smash it, it brings out you know something. Makes me feel good. <clears throat> so it just mince up the garlic. Um, You know, if you play with garlic, you know, the garlic's kind of easy to burn. So I tend to add it a little later. Uh, I've got one of these burners that is a little hot to come fast. And, you know, be careful. All right, so garlic will be ready. I just want to, I just want to cook these. Um, Leaks down until they're soft, and again, you're trying to get the flavor. And you'll you'll see a lot of recipes, you know, about you know how vegetables release their juices, and that's really what you're trying to to do here. You're trying to get to a place where the the flavor of the vegetable gets um, kicked out by the heat. Again, salt, fat, acid, heat, and uh, the heat just does, you know, amazing things. This, I've got a quote I'll leave, I'm going to read in a little bit about how humans, um, they discovered cooking before they discovered uh, nutrition. 
um, because cooking, of course, made it easier to eat food. Um, and then, of course, makes it more flavorful, um, even though my daughter prefers her vegetables raw. Um, someday, she'll discover how, now nah, you cook it. Man, it tastes good. All right, so that's going to keep cooking down. I've got my garlic ready. Um, because there's no uh, animal fat in, in this recipe, um, I'll save those mushrooms for her. Uh, it calls for a little bit of a soy sauce. Um, this is one we, we picked up at a, an Asian uh, restaurant, I mean, a grocery store over in St. Louis Park. Um, it calls for tomato paste. I don't use enough tomato paste, so I've kind of gotten into this tube of it. It doesn't go as bad. It's a, actually a sun-dried tomato paste. has a kind of fun, fun taste to it, so we'll use some of that. I've got a... Um, I'll get my thyme and bay leaf over there, my vegetable stock. Um, sure. I would love to be one of those people who makes his own stocks. I just haven't quite gotten to that yet. People save their turkey carcasses and chicken carcasses and make all that into stock. There's a this um, particular recipe calls for a uh, a topping that we'll make with uh, these oyster mushrooms in a bit. So I'm going to save some of those aside. Actually, I'll save them in their nifty container. Um, all right. Let's see. Let's get the garlic going. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a, a recipe that that calls for uh, wine. And um, one of the questions that often comes up on cooking sites is like, what wine do you use? Now this is Bourguignon, so it calls for a Burgundy. I don't have any Burgundy, I've got, I'm gonna use a Zinfandel, which I thought was kind of, this is a Zinfandel called Rabble. I thought it sort of looked like the craziness in our country last week. Um, but I love going to France 44, they got, great wine guys up there but you know if you don't drink or if, if you know alcohol is concerned you know when you cook with with wine you cook out the alcohol so um there's of course a lot of flavor so no worries as far as cooking with wine but definitely don't buy like go to the store and buy cooking wine it's just it's got salt in it it's just terrible um the rule of thumb is if you, if you wouldn't drink it um don't cook with it so anyway, but if you don't drink, then just get a, you know, just get a bottle of wine and have it around to cook with. I keep a bottle of white in the refrigerator to cook with and uh, sherry and port and other stuff to throw in the flavors. So I'm just throwing the garlic in. Let that cook up a little bit. I should probably just put just a little more butter in just because we're almost up to a stick. Not quite. Daniel, can you say something about the uses of the five kinds of salt? Yeah, so um, the kosher salt, <clears throat> which is in my nifty little Vermont handcrafted salt mill. Um, it's just what you kind of cook as you go. And then I've got uh, just sea salt that I'll use at the end as seasoning. And these are just flavored salt. So uh, there's Maldon, which is called finishing salt. There's uh, Maldon smoked finishing salt. I had some pink Himalayan salt. I had some Icelandic salt from a volcano. Used all that up. They all have just different flavors to them. Um, so, you know, in a sense, uh, <clears throat> this dish covers, you know, it doesn't have animal in it, but it's got vegetable, fungus, mineral. Um, so if you had some, if you want to like put some, you know, prosciutto or something fattier like a pancetta or sopracetto, something in place of the butter in the bottom for a different flavor profile, you cover all your, your groups. <clears throat> Um, all right, now we're going <clears> to <throat> just give a little squeeze of the tomato paste here. It calls for a tablespoon, I think. I'm going to put just a couple squeezes. 
Again, it's just another flavor. It's also kind of part of that acid profile where the wine's doing most of that. Um, and then this recipe calls for some flour, and I'm going to put that in. That's mostly just to thicken the sauce. The reduction will provide some of that, but not enough to thick. And it's also going to give you this stuff on the bottom of your um, Dutch oven called uh, fond. And fond is just a, a great um, flavor enhancement. A lot of times if you're following a recipe, it'll say, make sure you scrape up the brown bits from the bottom. The brown bits are that fond. And if you do uh, <clears throat> uh, Cajun cooking, you'll you know be familiar with ruse. Of course, French cooking uses a lot of ruse and sauces and gravies. And so in a sense, it's, I guess, kind of like that. Um, mostly to thicken the sauce, but add another layer of flavor. So I'm going to let that uh, thicken up a little bit. <clears throat> There's an, another comment about um, a lot of recipes call for garlic at the very beginning. Why did you wait and what is the purpose of waiting on the garlic? Yeah, I just, I'll wait on the garlic just because uh, I just tend to burn it. And when you burn the garlic, it, um, you know, it just gets a little rancid edge to it. But I mean, depending on the recipe, like if you're just doing a saute, you know, put the garlic in, then add the food you're sauteing, you know. Um, now, don't confuse burnt garlic in a skillet with roasted garlic. Like you roast garlic. I mean, that's like some of the sweetest, most delicious stuff in the world. But that's something you do in your oven for an hour before you would add it to a recipe. So now we're gonna go to the wine. We're gonna go to the rabble wine and we're gonna try to heat up a little bit. And we're just gonna see the sizzle. I think it calls for a cup and a half. So I'm going about three quarters of a cup. Now you, you can't see this or feel it, but what I'm doing at the moment is that I'm uh, scraping all those brown bits off of the bottom. And that gives us uh, another bit of flavor. Again, you know, measure this stuff out, but you can already see, ooh, just, just looks pretty. And then um, again, if I had vegetable stock. I've kind of gotten into this thing recently where I'm, trying to do more with just water instead of these box stocks. But this is a vegetable stock. I think the recipe also calls for the possibility of um, beef stock. If you use beef stock, then you've got your animal in there. Um, but if you want to keep this uh, vegetarian, I guess it wouldn't be vegan because there's butter in it. But if you want to keep it vegetarian, then... Um, so um, I'm going to... Again, do a little more salt. I should probably taste this at some point. Bay leaf. Everybody loves bay leaves. Um, fresh thyme. Uh, some people will put, I uh, probably should put this into a little, uh, what's it called, Rick? The little pouch. Um, you know, that way you can take out your herbs without leaving off. Sachet. 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 Yeah. yeah, the sachet. And what that does is it keeps those little uh, time stems from getting in the food, but I didn't make a sachet. It's fun to say though, sachet. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn the heat up on this little bit, get it to a boil. <clears throat> um, and then <clears throat> once, it, once it gets to a boil, we're uh, gonna turn it down, we're gonna add the mushrooms and onions back in and just let it start to cook down. Now, if you, um, it's already good. Um, you know, you want to, you want to watch as it thickens. You want to taste as it thickens because obviously as it reduces, it intensifies and, um, you don't want to add any more salt at this point just because as, as it reduces down, it'll get more salty. But this is going to cook your onions down, your mushrooms down and, um, you get another look. It's all cooking in there now, and you're like, oh, ooh, ah, it's so good. <laughs> so we're just going to turn it down, let it simmer, let some of those flavors come together, and um, hey, everybody. Woo -woo. How's that look, Rick? I see you on there. What, what did I forget? All right. What's that cook? <clears throat> um... Sarah, is there, is, is Kathy doing a presentation? Oh, we, well, at the beginning, um, Judy did a little intro. We can talk a little bit more about CES. Um, Judy, if you want. Uh, 
I was just looking at the time and seeing it was about that time. I oh yeah, we actually, yep. So we just started with talking about CES and stuff. Okay, all right. Um, okay, well, is there, not, yeah. Well, I've got a, you know, I haven't preached in a while, so I've got a few thoughts. Um, but first I'm gonna get these oyster mushrooms ready. We're gonna, um, we're just gonna saute those in some, some butter and then, again, this is my, this is Violet's. If you want it, if, if Violet were ever to come to your house, if you were to say, <clears throat> Violet, what would you like for a snack? And you had parsley, that's what she wants. We grew like six, four parsley plants in our garden this summer and she ate them all like a rabbit. She um, loves raw parsley. And the nice thing about, you know, the fresh parsley, the stems are super tender and you can just cook up the, the stems. But this is just, this will just be a finish for the dish itself. Um, I think you'll, you'll read how this dish, you can serve it over egg noodles, potatoes, any starch. I think we're gonna do grits. Um, we don't have any polenta, so I think we're gonna eat it over some grits. I've got these great stone ground grits from North Carolina, here where I grew up, that I love. And, I have mine over there later in the day, not for breakfast. All right, let me just check this and <clears throat> I want to give it about give it about 15 minutes. Now just you know you want to check it to make sure that again this burner's kind of tends to be a little hot, so I'm gonna just cover it over partially so it doesn't reduce down too quickly. Um, Right. So, those of you that, that went to uh, Israel with, uh, with Dawn and I and Violet um, while Dawn was, was sick in 2019, we'll remember that we, when we were in, uh, uh, I think it was Capernaum, I can't remember, when we talked about uh, the Jewish feast that people returned to Jerusalem for, and there's four of those, and one of them is Pentecost. But all of these feasts that people come back for, Passover, Pentecost, um, Tabernacles, and oh, blanking on the fourth one, maybe some extra money. Um, but they're all they're all involved food. Um, you know, they're all uh, special foods, symbolic foods, and of course the Bible is full of of food as as symbol. Um, for us as Christians, you know, we are super familiar with. The language of communion, uh, the experience of communion, which of course is bread and, and wine. And you might remember from one of my Sundays there that early communion also had olives and honey and other uh, aspects too, just to celebrate the, the goodness of creation and kind of the fullness of that imagery that shows up in the Bible. And then, of course, Pentecost itself, I always think it's uh, coincidental, if not ironic, that, you know, the the symbol of, of Pentecost are these blazing tongues. Um, but, you know, tongues, of course, are not only used to speak, but also uh, used to, to taste. Um, you know, I would, I would go so far being the flavor lover as I am to say that, you know, flavor can be a spiritual experience. I mean, we taste something amazing and down south you would say, I've died and gone to heaven. That's like one of the best things you could say to a cook. I remember some, uh, a couple of years ago, um, when we were out in Southern California, Don and I went to a, um, a restaurant by a very famous chef, um, Nancy uh, Silverton, a place called Austria Moza in LA. And I remember the, uh, the server coming up and saying to us, there was this particular, um, I can't remember the name of the, the dish. Um, it's not pasta al norma, but it's this orchid pasta, the sausage sauce that I've tried to replicate unsuccessfully. But she introduced the dish by going, this dish will change your life. I mean, wow, like how do you not eat something that will change your life? And it really was that good. I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty spectacular. So um, the fact that eating food, good food, you know, can be a spiritual experience. I always tell friends who, who laugh at me for spending so much time preparing a meal. I'm like, well, you gotta eat. It might as well taste good. Um, and of course, unfortunately, in uh, this day and age, a lot of flavor we, we enjoy comes artificially um, 
because people just don't want to take the time. But but time also is just a very a very spiritual thing to to allow transformation to occur uh, in the context of cooking or life itself. I think it's an important lesson when we slow down and you know, let God do do God's work on us. Um, it's it's very powerful. Uh, one of my my favorite encourage. Of, of home cooking um, is, of course, the great Italian home chef of Marcella Hazan. And uh, she died a few years ago, but was very famous for her um, being able to teach people like me how to prepare authentic Italian food. And she has this great quote that I actually put in a, an article I wrote for Christianity Today for Christmas. Some of you may have heard this already. But I wanted to read it because it's just it's sort of a um, something I live by, but first I want to check this sauce because it's kind of it's bubbling a lot. So let me just check. Oh no, we're good. Oh, okay, hang on, we need a more liquid in here. Hang on, one second. Um, I don't want to cook down too fast. Um, those mushroom chunks are a little big, but they'll get good and soft. And yeah. Um, she says, uh, cooking is an act of love. I, I do enjoy the craft of cooking, of course. Otherwise, I would not have done so much of it. But that is a very small part of the pleasure it brings me. What I love is to cook for someone. To put a freshly made meal on the table, even if it is something very plain and simple, as long as it tastes good and is not a ready-to-eat something bought at the store, this is a sincere expression of affection. It is an act of binding intimacy directed at whoever has a welcome place in your heart. And while other passions in your life may at some point begin to bank their fires, the shared happiness of good homemade food can last as long as we do. For years, I had that quote taped on my refrigerator. Of course, Marcella Hazan is mostly famous because she, she just cooked for her husband. He'd come home from work and they lived in the New York apartment and she just did this food for her husband and I had always called Dawn my cooking muse because uh, she loved what I cooked and it was just fun to uh, just cook for her. Um, I miss that. Um, so, so a couple things back, you know, to the Bible. I think this being the case, it's it's uh, it's important then to remember that Jesus described himself as the bread of life, right? That this was the the sign of love that that he gave to us and that he would sit in his last act on earth before he was killed to be a shared meal with his disciples. Uh, him to say, I long to eat this meal for you with you before I go. Um, just signals again the power of, of shared food uh, for community and for love. You know, the end of time, Revelation talks about the final consummation of all things being a banquet. Um, and then, of course, we, we know from uh, ancient uh, Near Eastern practices uh, that the way that you make peace with somebody is to share a meal. Uh, because the idea is you can't kill somebody, you eat them. Now, again, if you've seen The Godfather, you know that's probably not true. But, um, but the idea is that, we, uh, that to eat together is a sign of peace. And if you think about being in an argument with someone you love, you know, there are those times when you can uh, gather around the table and find a sudden, by sharing good food, uh, some of that, that anger dissipates. That's why we send our kids to bed without supper when we're mad at them. When we're happy with them, we keep them at the table, right? You know, the sign of, the sign of peace. Anyway, I would, I would say, um, as you've already heard me say that, really the secret uh, to great flavor um, is the sauce. And that a lot of things go together to make up a flavorful, uh, flavorful sauce. Uh, good ingredients, <clears throat> a strong pot, uh, slow heat, and time. And I hope you can see the uh, analogies to deep spirituality. Um, got some notes here. A flavorful sauce possesses both intensity and power. It expresses love and beauty and elicits genuine joy. And the smell is as good as the taste. I mean, food is one of those things that really does touch so many senses. Even, even sound, I mean, you think of a good crunch or a good snap or 
a lip smack or a yum yum. I mean, all of that stuff touches the ears too, right? Um, you get into the, the New Testament after Jesus and, and Paul's, the Apostle Paul talks about our witness to the world as Christians uh, is something he calls the aroma of Christ uh, to God. Now, I would, I would add just as a, a sidebar on that one, and I'm, you know, again, I don't preach anymore, but this is a little preachy. Uh, you know, when, when Paul uses that language of aroma, it is tied to sacrifice, right? Because I mean, the, the whole idea of a good smell had to do with sacrifice. And in the Old Testament sacrificial system, as they would sacrifice animals, um, the smell would, you know, make its way around the community. But it was the sacrifice. You didn't just burn the food. You cooked it and people would eat it. Uh, so the sacrifice was really a really a, a sweet smell, um, fragrance, fragrance of life. Let me take a look at this sweet smelling sauce and um, see how we're doing here. I'm going to give it a taste. And part of what you're just trying to do is, is not only to, to kind of get down to the flavor, but um, oh, so good. Um, almost all trying to get down to the flavors. At this point, I kind of I kick over the kosher sauce. Really, just because it's fun to do this. Um, I'm sorry, the, the sea salt. But you, you know, what you want here is you want the carrots to to get tender. And I'm actually going to turn this down a little more because it's still going a little hard. But so you know, I for me, um, you know, at the end of a, a difficult day. Um, I, I love to, to chop and cook and um, prepare food. One of my New Year's resolutions again, and again, not, to, not meaning to pickle my daughter too much. We have this conversation a lot. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm trying to decide. I have so many pans. I'm trying to decide which one I want to use. Um, I love my cast iron. I'm going to use my office. Um, at the end of the day, there's just for me a lot of, of, of peace and satisfaction that comes with uh, chopping. Love the chop. So anyway, fat sticking with butter as my fat. I, learned, I did this thing um, a couple of years ago where some of you, if you read the Star Tribune, you're probably familiar with the food writer Meredith Deeds. Uh, she lives in Edina. She's a cookbook writer and has great recipes, easy to make and always super flavorful. So uh, one year, Dawn and I decided that, that it would be fun to host a, a dinner party for our neighbors, trying to meet some of our neighbors. It's a great way to meet people you don't know is so invited to dinner. And on the offhand, I, I shot a, an email to um, Meredith Deeds, because her email's in the paper, asked her if she'd come over and cook. And she said, yes. So you probably remember the story. So she came over and taught me. We made rack of lamb and asparagus risotto and some kind of souffle because I wanted to kind of up my French cooking skills. And she did a whole demonstration right here in this little kitchen. We all sat over there and she made it for us. And one of the things, I, two things I learned that's been takeaway. One is, you know, a lot of times a recipe calls for um, toasted nuts. So, you know, uh, almonds or hazelnuts or whatever. Um, and a lot of times we get a pan out, and if you're like me, you forget about it, and they burn, and you got to start over. But you can do that in the microwave. You can take almonds, sliver almonds, put them in the microwave for a couple of minutes, and they'll toast up all brown, and I get burned. I'm like, probably not. And then she also taught how, you know, if you've, uh, I mean, this is, if nonstick cooking, there's nothing better than the seasoned cast iron pan. <laughs> Love that thing. Um, they last forever, and they cost $25. Um, but I also learned from her that, you know, instead of a, a nonstick pan that always goes bad because of the coatings they put on them. If you just will heat up your stainless steel pan first, then add the fat. It'll work as a kind of nonstick surface because the fat will sort of ride the top of the surface. If you put it in and then heat it up, you won't get that nonstick as well. The things you learn. So um, this right here, I think you'll see in some of the comments, and if you're a uh, if you go up to websites and uh, read the recipes, it's always fun to read all the people's notes. It is kind of funny, though, because people will write all these notes about the things they did differently. And you're like, well, why are you even using this recipe if you're going to do everything different? But sometimes there's good stuff. And 
you'll see a lot of people mention in this uh, recipe that they're not using this step because they didn't feel like the the sauteed mushrooms added a lot at the end. But if you're, if you're a fan of uh, Melissa Clark, you know she always loves to add something at the end just for a kind of flair. So this is a uh, these are just um, the oyster mushrooms that we're gonna actually cook to a little bit of a crisp and um, sprinkle them with some smoked paprika. Again, just another kind of flavor enhancement. Again, I'm a salt as you go kind of guy. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how you uh, how you buy your spices. <clears throat> but another great thing about the co-op is all the spices are sold in bulk. And you probably know that spices, you know, lose a lot of their flavor after a year. And, you know, if you don't use them enough, you've got these bottles of spices that you open them up and don't even taste like spices anymore. Um, but if you buy them in bulk, you just get what you need and uh, smaller quantities and they'll stay fresh and yum yum. So I can already see what's happening uh, here is as these are getting uh, cooked down, you're getting, a, again, that little crust on the bottom. So I might throw a, a splash of sherry or something in there to pull out the, the flavor and get that fond up. This is cooking good. Gosh, it's really. And again, depending on, you know, this is really not intended to be a, this isn't a sauce. It's more of a stew. So it's certainly getting to that. Um, it's just so good. And it's really, I should let you taste this. Um, yeah. It's just getting really good. Yeah. It's a little bit more, but. Say something like, oh, that's good. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but you will you will notice um, now this is where I'm going to do just a little splash of the soy sauce it just as a again a, got that salt to it but also that um, intensity that just adds another layer um, so instead of adding any more salt just a little splash of the soy sauce and make sure you, ch you taste your soy sauce this one from this Asian market is super salty, so I've had to measure. Okay. That liquid's really going down, so I'm gonna put the whole top on while I finish this off. Let these get crisp, and you can see they're kind of crisping up. You can see that fond on the bottom. And, and what you do with this is you, you plate it and then you just put those on top and get the parsley and it's kind of cute. I'm going to grab a plate here for that. I, I still always marvel at how, um, how you know, because vegetables are mostly water, right? So as you cook them down, you know, and, and get to the real essence of the vegetable, I just think that's so cool. So I'm going to just uh, use a splash of sherry to get that stuff off the bottom. This is an acid. It's just, um, it's cool. That's fun. Um, it just get, allows you to get the fond off the bottom and makes it easier to clean. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because unfortunately, doing that gets rid of some of your crispiness, but it'll get back there. Take a little bit of the smoked paprika, which is a wonderful flavor if you've never used it. Um, Rick, is the is the smoke and smoked paprika? Is that just an artificial add, or what is that? Or a natural smoke flavor? That's actually we a don't great, know. Yeah, that's a great question. I have never researched that. <laughs> Yeah, I just always wondered where they got the smoke from. I didn't know if it was 
I'm sure it's not the. I'm sure unless they like is like is it like smoked chilies? Maybe they they roast the paprika. I think it's part of the processing, but we're gonna look it up. Okay. So anyway, I'm just gonna um, put those in there, and I'm gonna just I'm gonna just put another splash in here just for the sake of cleaning this thing, because otherwise you gotta get out through it. According to Google, uh, smoked paprika is made by drying peppers over smoking oak wood over a period of 10 to 15 days. Okay. That's kind of cool. Come through with the hot here. Just gonna put in here and make it easier to clean. All right. So, um, you know, the recipe calls for a, a 30 to 40 minute cook down. And, um, and I think to do that, I'll probably just let it keep simmering. I'm going to have to add some more um, liquid to it. And I'll probably will just do that. But I'm just going to go ahead and throw a little bit out on a plate. You can see what it looks like. Um, and just, just know that I'm going to keep cooking it after this is over. And, just going to taste better and better as it cooks. So, you know, you just throw your starch on the bottom, egg noodles or grits or whatever. And then, you know, you want to take out your bay leaf. I see it right there. I'm going to keep it in there because I want to keep it. Take out your thyme fronds, but those are going to be hard to get, but they're in there. Um, you see that? You just throw a little bit of this uh, mushroom on top. A little bit of the parsley, um, and I probably will just check the salt here on it. Yeah, you could throw a little bit of the finishing salt on it just to draw out that last little bit, but it'll 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 get even better as it cooks down for another fifteen minutes. <clears throat> and that's it, mushroom bourguignon. Bon appetit, as, jo as Julia would say. Any other questions or thoughts or anything? I have one more quote for you for the end. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Jackie Carlson, I think you unmuted yourself. Oh, I just really enjoyed this, Daniel. It was good to see you again. Think about all the wonderful buffets we had every night in Israel. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. You know, probably one of the last thoughts I would um, I would would add is you know this this whole idea of you know reducing for the sake of flavor. You know when when Paul uses that as an analogy, he really is tying it to this idea of uh, getting into good trouble for Christ's sake or experiencing a kind of persecution that being reduced as a, a kind of humility. And if there's anything that just repeats over and over in the Bible, it's, it's that, you know, the lower you're forced to go, the higher God will exalt you up. And I, I think there's an analogy in cooking, you know, the lower down you go, whether the slowness of the heat or the reduction of the sauce, the more intense and beautiful and powerful the flavor. And I just like that kind of spiritual connection in nature itself and in cooking that we can, you know, we can find our, our best selves as we are reduced down and humbled through the things of life that 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 push us into those those deep uh, those deep faith spaces. Mm -hmm. So let me close. Thanks. This is a this um, is a Daniel. We had a couple other we had a couple other questions that came oh, through. Yeah. Or, it looks like Kim, go ahead. You had unmuted yourself. Oh yeah, I just want to say, Daniel, it's Kim. Um, this is very inspiring. I took lots of notes and I have definitely a need to get a new pot. Yes. So get a new, get, if you need a, yeah, just, just drop the $350 for the Le Creuset. <laughs> Ever buy another one. You can't break it. It'll break your foot before it would break the pot. It really is just fabulous. Hey, Kim, you remember this? Oh, yes, I do. Many lunches. Yeah, we had a lot of lunches this is when Kim was moderator. That was a, a parting Christmas present she gave me one year. So still pairings, of course, is closed, but the memories continue. Right? Yeah.
Awesome. Well, and um, uh, Rick and Paige, thanks for being uh, good commentators joining us this morning on all the things. You should get and Rick to do one of these, Sarah. You should I know. Rick. Well, and uh, Rick was asked a question about um, just as a chef, like, is he working right now? And uh, I'll note the comment and then Rick, you jump in and say anything else. About Not presently. He took a break from uh, kitchens a few years ago and is working on opening his own restaurant, hopefully this year. Do you want to say anything about that, Rick? You're muted. Ah. All right. I, I hit the button the same moment you did, Rick. So I muted you when you unmuted yourself. So can you unmute yourself again? There we go. Uh, yeah, we're called, um, we're called Houndstooth. Um, we're going to be hopefully opening in South Minneapolis. We've been on, on this road for three years now, and uh, we just finally found a building. <laughs> So. And now it's even more of an uphill battle. So we'll yeah. we'll keep everybody posted. <laughs> yeah. And once it happens, I'm going to come over and just hang around the kitchen and learn stuff. That's perfect. That's You're so great. welcome. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That's great. And uh, any other questions for Daniel from folks about this dish, or then I'll, um, after that, I think I'll go to. Um, We'll go back and just kind of wrap up about CS. I'll let folks know what's coming up next, and then you do, can do your wrap up with the the last piece you have, Daniel. Okay. Okay. I, Any I other enjoyed, questions? Okay, go ahead, I, Andrea. I enjoyed it. The cooking show. I liked it, <laughs> and um, he reminds me of my neighbor. How he was cutting the vegetables. My name. My neighbor comes and helps me cook things, and she kind of cuts the same way as he does. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. When, you're cutting, when you're cutting your vegetables, if you just keep the point of the knife down on the cutting block and chunk, 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 it'll speed it up and it's, it's so satisfying. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, uh, when, when is dinner? When yeah. is dinner? Uh, it'll be as soon as we're done. We're just going to start dinner early. I mean, it's time. <laughs> That is great. Um, Judy, I just want to come back to you um, in terms of like your long work with CES and just, you know, anything coming up from today and hearing from Daniel and thinking about food insecurity and um, how our faith connects, you know, with either things that have come up for you that you've learned or anything that you would just like to share with us as we're thinking about our ministry of the month and these connections with faith and food. Well, one of the things I appreciated about CES I first became acquainted with them through an urban plunge we did. We supported a lot of ministries in Minneapolis at that time, and we were supporting 10 food shelves. But anyway, we had an urban plunge, and I went to CES, and I was really impressed with the leadership and their kindness and their caring for the clients. They just didn't have people come in. They handed them a bag of food, and they went out. We interviewed each client and um, found out what they needed. And then at the end of the interview, we, it was suggested that we ask them if we could pray for them. And sometimes they'd say no, or sometimes, you know, we'd say, well, is there anything, if they'd say yes, you'd say, well, is there any special concern you'd like us to pray with? And sometimes I had grown men who would cry because of their situation that would be, you know, so upsetting to them. And it just was a real privilege to be able to pray with these strangers and give them some encouragement. You know, we're not only giving them bags of food, but we were giving them spiritual help too. And CES also gives out money for rent sometimes, bus tickets, special needs people have. And I talked to Ann Williamson, she and Dave have been volunteering there recently. And it's changed so much because we had a very primitive food shelf. All we had was canned goods. Now they serve fresh fruits and vegetables and they serve, um, a lot of, um, well, sanitary products, diapers, all those kinds of things. We didn't have any of that back in the, it was in the 90s when I was there mostly. And uh, so in 20 years, they've really improved a lot and they've upgraded the building. It's so much nicer now in the basement, they have shelves. It's, it's kind of like going through a grocery store experience. You meet with a client, you go down there and you walk with them as they pick out the items they need. And they usually are given food 
amount of food compared, I mean, depending on the size of their family. So they really have done a great job. And they also, out of that, that church, they run a, um, the largest Meals on Wheels program in the state of Minneapolis, state of Minnesota, I mean. So they've done a wonderful job. And I think it's great that we can continue to support them. Mm, great. Judy, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. There's one other Go thing ahead. I'd like to mention. Yep. Um, at the time, I was also chairman of our, we called it the local hunger committee at our church. And we would run the food drives every year, two or three food drives every year. And um, it was hard sometimes because it was much more efficient to give money because they can, they can take that money and use it at Second Harvest Heartland and buy food at a discount and then get much more bang for the buck. But um, at the, at, so sometimes I think when you have a food drive, if you can ask people to give food, which is so symbolic, you can go with the kids to the store and buy things and say, we're giving this to hungry families. So give food, but then also put in a check for some extra money because it goes so much further. In those days, we used to say they could get a dollar, you know, a dollar a pound is about what they could get it for. And I don't know what it is today, but uh, yeah. they do get a, a lot of bang for their buck with money. That's great. Thank you. And, and just a couple of different ways and you can go to our website, uh, colonialchurch.org forward slash mission. And all the information is there about CES, the ways that you can connect and um, bring food, et cetera. You can give directly to CES financially. You can also give through Colonial this month um, by going uh, to our website, colonialchurch.org forward slash give. And then if you give online, just in your um, giving memo, just say ministry of the month. Uh, and we'll ensure all those funds, if you indicate that, will go directly then to CES on behalf of Colonial Church. Um, and so thank you, Judy, so much for being here and for your work with CES and um, for that is our ministry of the month. And uh, Daniel, uh, thank you so much for being here today. I know we're not quite done yet. Daniel's gonna wrap us up here and bring us home. Um, but just also to, uh, invite you next week, uh, if you've been missing Wednesday nights this last year, we invite you to join us as Chef Jeff is going to be with us uh, this next Saturday. And he is going to be basically taking a pot roast as a central dish to then show how you can take uh, a big passion of his is to not waste any food and to really see how you can get creative with food. So he'll be taking a central dish pot roast and showing you all the different things you could do during a week with the leftovers from that dish and um, doing some stuff with, I hear some pie might make an appearance. Um, but if you've been missing Wednesday nights, we invite you to join us next Saturday, same time, same channel. Um, but again, thanks everyone for being here. Daniel, um, why wrap us up for today and share a little bit uh, what you'd like as a closing. And you know, if you uh, if you're a part of Wednesday Night Live, the, the reason that there was always a soup was that's where the previous week's uh, food leftovers would usually end up in uh, one of Jeff's uh, soups. He he really is amazing at uh, just not wasting anything and making it making it go. I, I learned a ton from from him um, getting to cook back in the kitchen with him. Um. All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with uh, one of my, my favorite quotes by uh, uh, a food writer named uh, Robert Capon. He was uh, also a theologian, an Episcopal priest, had a column in the New York Times for years about food and has written some incredible books. And <clears throat> he died in 2013, but a lot of, a lot of his writing uh, continues to, to resonate. Um, he was a, a critic more than a recipe writer, but, um, Really liked his stuff. He, uh, there's a, if you're looking for a, a book that that sort of celebrates spirituality and food, um, his is called The Supper of the Lamb, The Supper of the Lamb by Robert Capon. It's just a delightful read. He has a whole chapter on peeling an onion as a spiritual experience. It's worth the read itself. If you read Moby Dick, it's kind of like that chapter about the whale. Oh, really interesting. So here's uh, from Robert Capon. Humans invented food before they thought of nutrition. To be sure, food keeps us alive, but that is only its smallest and most temporary work. Its eternal purpose 
is to furnish our sensibilities against the day when we shall sit down at the heavenly banquet and see how gracious the Lord is. Nourishment is necessary only for a while. What we shall need forever is taste. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time, for these people, for our church, for all the ways that you work in our lives. We are grateful for farmers and for grocery store workers and packers and folks who transport, for home cooks and recipe writers and all of us for whom we cook and who eat and who enjoy the fruits of your good creation. We, we pray that that food would nourish us, but as importantly, that it would bring us joy and, and hope and a sense of uh, connection to all that, that you have made. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, you can feel free, anyone who wants to, you can stick around. Um, we'll leave this room open for a little bit if you'd like, or you can um, jump off now again. Join us next week with Chef Jeff. This, by the way, um, this is on YouTube. If you want to share uh, what Daniel worked on this morning, you can feel free to share that with anyone. But blessings, everyone. Thank and thanks for being here. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Will there be a recipe online for us? Oh, yes. Yep, the recipe is both on um, our website, but I also put it in the links on the YouTube page. Okay. Thank so you. it's there. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, Judy, so much for sharing about CS oh, this welcome. morning. Yeah, Bye. it's so great. <laughs> Hi, everyone, it's nice to thank see you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paige, thanks for the commentary. That was really fun. It was super cute to see you all nerding out about it, too. <laughs> That was really great. Yeah. Look at Lori, were you cooking along? You have your apron on. You look like you were, were you doing it? I was, but you know, I have to tell you my story is that I am not a cook at all. Yeah. And about five years ago, my, my daughter-in-law suggested that I try some of these boxes, Blue Apron, uh, Hello Fresh boxes. And I held such a guilt over my cooking because my kids grew up with, you know, pretty minimal stuff. You know, it was the quick, fast food, whatever we could, because I just didn't plan ahead, wasn't that interested. Bottom line was, is that I started these boxes and it was like, I am producing something that actually tastes nice. and it's all fresh ingredients. And so that began, has begun my journey to the point that it's given me a confidence and a joy oh. and love of fresh, you know, everything that we're talking about here. And it was like, Oh my gosh. So I have, you know, COVID brain, needless to say, I didn't know, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, it's Saturday. I have no ingredients. Ran out this morning, picked up my ingredients, <laughs> started oh. chopping away. And needless to say, I'm in the process of cooking. I'm just few, a few steps behind with the joy, of, you know, not only to share it with my family, you know, and to appreciate good food, but now, and of course, all the spiritual things that Daniel, that you're saying, it's like, so true, you know. I mean, it's like oh. Oh. sweet. Laurie's what Laurie's one of our BK 